What if I were to tell you that despite playing the Cyberpunk 2077 story in its entirety, you are still missing a large portion of the Cyberpunk story? Not only that, but you're missing the real versions of what has taken place. Johnny Silverhand has lied to you. Well, maybe lied wouldn't be the proper term, seeing as his engram truly believes his own versions of events. The details and quote unquote flashbacks we experience are not a one for one brain dance of reality. They're altered to fit a specific narrative and agenda that people in higher places would want you to believe. Cyberpunk 2077 is actually based on a series of tabletop RPGs created by Mike Pondsmith and his team at Artelzorian Games. Yeah, this series began in the late 1980s. There's a vast amount of lore to uncover, but the closest in proximity happens to be the Cyberpunk Red sourcebook. While acting as the average rulebook you might expect for a tabletop, it also provides us three separate stories encompassing Silverhand's life, even after death. While two of these pull from past storylines and even add new details to provide context to 2077's plot, which are never fade away in the 2013 raid, and Fall of the Towers covering the 2023 raid, there's a story unique to Red, titled Black Dog. It covers the story of a group of edge runners transporting, unknown to them, the preserved body of Johnny Silverhand. All these stories and their details play a vital role in the world of cyberpunk and Silverhand. I have previously narrated each of these stories in standalone videos. However, this video acts as a complete collection with some alterations to the editing. A single stop for all the stories rather than having to jump around. If you enjoy keeping up to date on Cyberpunk's vast lore, theories, and overall future, I suggest subscribing to my channel and checking out my other content. I greatly appreciate having you all along. Each story in its entirety will be timestamped as well for your own ease of access. Without further delay, here is the Cyberpunk Red storytelling in its entirety. He's coming out of the hammer, about midnight, and sees them, three punks, mohawks, bright and bristly, with reflected neon, wearing high collar jackets, gang colors. Yo rocker boy, one of them yells, good show, good noise. Johnny Silverhand waves absently. Fans, they're right, the gig was good. He'd rarely been better, but the show's over. They start walking towards him. One waves a bottle. The light strikes oily yellow tequila, sloshing to and fro. Yo, Silver Rocker, he says. The smaller one with the face scarred in African tribal tattoos. Join us. Share some. Fair price for a good gig, eh? The distance is closing. Johnny steers Alt, his girlfriend, to his bad side. The one without the hand. Hey, Ice Brothers, he says, noting the gang's colors and speaking in a temporizing tone. Your offer's solid, but it's been a long gig. I'm nearly flatlined as it is. How about a replay next night? By that time, they're almost on him. He lets the 9mm drop from the spring holster, settling into the hand. Probably nothing, he thinks. Yeah, replay next night. The big one says enthusiastically, and that's when they hit him. This fast, they're a blur. The walther booms in the close confines of the alley. There's a metallic snick as the smaller punk brings up his arm. Light reflects off the fistful of razors that pretend to be a hand. An excruciating impact lifts Johnny off the ground. Blood sprays over the wet concrete. Silverhand hits with a bone-wrenching impact. His pale eyes stare blankly at the sky. Old's terrified screams recede swiftly into the dark, 60 to zero, and eight seconds flat. Johnny comes to. There's something like broken glass in his guts. Red fire blots out the cool blue neon. He rolls over in a pool of something greasy. Blood. His. A cat topples off the dumpster, picking a cautious pattern around his body. No fool, this cat. A survivor. Not going to get involved. Its eyes are tiny red LEDs moving up alley. Johnny watches it, smug bastard, he thinks, and closes his eyes. Behind his eyelids, red digitals feebly clock out his remaining moments. Bio clock running down, cars whispering past on the filthy rain-wet street beyond. 
A trauma team ambulance in the distance, siren screaming. But not for him, he's checking out. He stares blankly up at the flat black ceiling of a city. Overhead, there's the shimmer of distance heat. The lightning interacting with the pink, actinic glow of the city lights. The stars look painted in. A VTOL passes overhead. Giant prop blades thrashing the night. Johnny tries reaching up to it. He can see the hand etched against the sky. Slick super chrome winking back at him. He balls the hand and bends his trademark into a chromed fist, servos clicking in one by one. He thrusts in of a gaping belly wound, gasping at the shock and pain. Somehow he gets to his feet, staggers to the alleyway. He leans his feverish face against the cool wet bricks. He makes a decision. He's not going to die. They're going to die. Closing his eyes, he pitches forward into the streak of passing traffic blur. Something stops him. Hands firmly grapple him, holding him up. Silverhand has just enough strength to open his eyes. There's a face looking intently at him, thin, bearded. Lord Almighty, the face says. They really did you, didn't they? Something is screaming when Johnny wakes up. Fine, just as long as it isn't him. He must have missed the ambulance ride to the hospital. But here in the trauma ward, he can hear the sound of jet engines. That's the screaming. It mounts higher and higher while the ward fills with warm air and the smell of ozone. From his stretcher, he can see the bulky AV-4 vehicle spin on its fans and hurtle upwards. The din dies down, and he can hear screaming for real all around him, casualties of the regular firefights around the city. The doctor puts him back together. The same doctor who did his transparent Kiroshi eyes, his trademark silver hand. The same doctor who plugged him for an interface and installed the software chips in the back of his skull. Johnny considers taking out a service contract. Microsurgical waddles rip cut through the perforated guts, swabbing, trying off, prepping. The doctor stitches in three feet of glistening wet tink rone intestine, plugs the punch holes with synthetic skin and muscle. Air hypos inject the area with speed drugs, fast healers, endorphins, and antibacterials. Microscopic stitches hum off the serrated teeth of a mini-closer, bonding flesh together, almost as well as the original. In a month or two, there won't even be a scar. Let's hear it for new tech. The doctor's hands are quick and sure. He has done this a thousand times. He has a German accent. Ah, uh, Johnny, Johnny, he says over and over as he works. Over his head, the sterilizer lamps glitter like an insect's multifaceted eyes. Johnny, when are you going to give this up? Says the doctor. When it ends, thinks Silverhand, from the fog of the dwarfs and general anesthetics. Johnny, says the doctor sadly. Silverhand is the second son of him. His first son was Johnny's best friend. His first son was killed in an inner corp war eight years ago. No man shall lose more than one son in a lifetime. Thanks, thinks Johnny. I owe you one again. His alleyway benefactor is named Thompson, a thin, reedy type, wearing an armor jack, trench coat, three sizes too large. He packs no visible hardware, but a mini cam. The mount straddles his head like an oversized headphone. A mic loops in front of his mouth, the camera itself coming around the right side of his skull and hardwiring into a startlingly bright green cyber optic. He's a media. A one-man team of cameraman and reporter. Direct feeding to some media corp down line. Hey Rocker, he says, leaning over the table as Silverhand recovers under the sterilizer beams, ready for a little vengeance. Johnny pulls on a red t-shirt. The shirt has the logo of his last band, Samurai. The shirt drags over the freshly stapled wounds, hangs up on the bandages. He curses in Japanese. He pulls an armor jacket over his shoulders. He pulls the auto shotgun out of his battered bedroom dresser, checking the load and weight. He slips it carefully into the worn underarm holster under the jacket. He stuffs shuriken into his pockets on the outer side of the jacket. He picks up the heavy HK smart gun and slips it into his back holster. There is a fury behind glittering pale eyes. So, he says, tell me. 
Thompson leans back into the wall, body bracing against Johnny's intensity. He grins, takes a slug of Silverhand's tequila. They didn't want you, they wanted her. She's an extraction, business as usual. Johnny's eyes are blank. No surprise, he comments shortly. He gathers up a ragged handful of shells and begins to stuff load the HK spare clip. Only the trembling of his hand, the me hand, betrays any emotion. So why'd they do me? He asks. He was home, grins Thompson. It's an old line. They both smile like friendly sharks. Thompson stops smiling. They wanted you flatlined so it looked like a gang job. Booster Gang sees the high and mighty Mr. John Silverhand out strolling with his input. Decides to slash him a bit. You go down, they grab her, they're gone like vapor. Real convenient when the cops find her body in an alley about a week later. They'll have motives. Lots of ugly motives. They'll be those of high-powered boosters, not pros. Pros. Silverhand finishes loading the second clip. He stuffs the remaining shells in my armor jacket's pockets. You can never have enough ammo. Yeah. Pros, repeats Thompson. You got shredded for fine, bro. At least a clean 10,000 euro bucks of hardware on those boys. The speed they hit you with took maybe a 70% reflex boost, and those were custom rippers. The type that pulled out along the fists. That sort of hardware isn't something you pick up on the street. You saw them on me? Thompson's eyes are cold, slate-like. You could write anything you wanted in them. Get real, he grates. These were pros. If I jump in, we'd both be dead. The eyes appraise him. You've been off the street too long, Rocker. You think everyone has a nice agent, a couple solos covering their butts, in a comfy apartment like this somewhere. I let you take it, because I knew it would take at least five minutes for you to bleed yourself dry. I wait for them to move on, and use my trauma card. There's a longish silence. Then, look, Rogger. You want a guilt loop, or you want to get your girl back? So name names, says Johnny. He sits down on the edge of the bed, favoring his stapled side. He reaches out for the tequila and takes a slug. Good news, bad news, says Thompson. He's unlimbered. The cyber cam unit from around his head and set it down on the table between them. The only indication of hardware is the silver-mounted skull plug drilled through his right temple. The cam's cellular link through the net is off. Thompson says, Good news is, it isn't one of the really big guys, like Euro business machines. Fair enough, says Silverhand taking another swig from the bottle. Bad news is it's Arasaka. Jesus H. Christ, explodes Johnny. The hand resting on the edge of a table convulses. There's a rending noise, and splinters fly in all directions. Your input was playing with hot deck materials, Rocker. You knew she ran for ITS, right? Yeah, so? So you gotta work somewhere. All didn't talk much about her work. True, but your alt was ITS's pet net runner. She moved info up and down the net, and handled their security as well. She made a lot of classy software just for them. She built Soul Killer, you know. Or maybe you didn't. Like you said, she didn't talk much about her work. Johnny sits back on the couch, the bottle halfway to his lips. Even the normally disconnected Silver Hand has heard of Soul Killer, a legendary black program that sucks the very soul from its Netrunner victims. Soul Killer? What a joke. Soul Killer is a 2 million meg AI super routine that can track an intruding Netrunner cyber link faster than a booster gang snorts drugs. It tears out the cyber pirate's brain with brutal force, recreating it in a frozen storage matrix inside the mainframe. The word is on the street that Soul Killer may be the closest thing to hell on Earth. And in these days, that's saying a lot. And Alt made that? Johnny bites down a momentary wave of revulsion, superimposed over Alt's big green eyes, tousled mane of hair. No wonder she didn't talk about her work, he says finally. I was following her rocker, says Thompson. Words out that Arasaka is working on its own version of Soul Killer. Something that can walk the net freely, getting up close and personal with people Arasaka don't like. A black program assassin for a security company? Johnny is up and pacing now. He knows where this is going, he doesn't like it. You probably believe in Santa Claus, too, says Thompson, reclaiming the dregs of the bottle. Your alt is the missing link. I figured they'd have to recruit her sooner or later, whether free or forced. Soul Killer's main programming is buried in her head somewhere, so I followed her. Thanks for the concern. You don't get it, Rocker Boy. I want Arasaka. 
I want them bad. I put anyone and anything on the line to get them, even myself. If I have to broadcast a story from the grave, I'll do it. They're mine. You get in my way, you're flatlined. You go with me. Thompson lets it trail out. Johnny stops pacing. The room goes still. Only the hand moves, like something alive. Silver metal joints clicking. Take up reels wearing. Tiny pistons shooting in and out in simulation of a pulse. The hand turns Johnny to face the media man. It makes him say, How long do we have? Thompson smiles lopsided. How long will it take your input to rewrite Soul Killer? A day? Two? Yeah. Johnny turns. Scoops up the keys to the Porsche. You chip for a smart gun? He says. Thompson reaches down to his feet, draws up a long black nylon bag. FN Fell Assault, says standing up. I was in the war. I like lead. Lots of lead. Rain runs down the front of the speeder. A wall of corporate glass and steel looms to either side as we pull onto the downtown traffic. The Porsche whistles, slightly in the chill air. It's methanol power plant throwing it against the city night. So where are we going, Rocker? Says Thompson. Johnny grits his teeth. I've got a marker. I have to pull in, he says. Rogue hates the Atlantis, but she goes there because the contacts are good, and the pickings are easy. Corporate's looking for a fast freelance assassination, the media's and runners looking to trade information, fixers of guns, armor, and smuggling jobs, but the place has bad memories. She only comes here because Santiago insists on it. Her back is to the wall of the booth. Her mere shaded eyes scan the room like monitor cameras. What she can't see is covered by her partner, Santiago, from the opposite side of the booth. His burly shoulders bolt a heavy armor jacket. He looks like Scowling Mountain. He's not her type, but he wants her. Somehow they've managed to work this out, the way they worked out combat style. The division of spoils. But he keeps hoping, stupid nomad. And then she finds herself facing what she's dreading for the last two years. The reason she hates this crummy bar. It's this crummy town. Johnny Silverhand walks into the Atlantis. He still has the move, she thinks, as he strides through the big brass doors. Head held high, a cocky light in his pale glass eyes. After all of his time, Rogue still can't decide whether she wants him or just wants to kill him. He looks like he owns the place as he crosses the room towards her. A comment to an old friend here, smiling at a fan there. A narrowed glance at a potential troublemaker, and he stands in front of her. Rogue, he says, like nothing ever happened. I need your help, Rogue. His voice is urgent, magnetic. You can go to hell, she replies lovely. On the other side of the booth, there's a faint sound as Santiago slides one hand over the Mac-10 in his lap. Johnny leans closer. Look, he says. I'm sorry. I know how you feel. I wouldn't do this if I had any other choice. Pulls up a chair and straddles it, staring at her. Tough, she shoots back acidly. She hopes her voice sounds steadier than she feels. You owe me one, he says, his voice taking an edge. For Chicago, you owe me one at least. And it's not like I won't pay you. I've got Euro. How much? Interjects Santiago. Johnny turns to face him. Word on the street is you're pulling five grand a night. I'll match and double it. Santiago's eyes grin in his swarthy face. He scratches his chin with his free hand. His partner has a real mad on about this guy, but he's a face. He's got credit. That pulls weight in Santiago's world. How long? Two days max. I need an extraction. I won't haze you. It's Arasaka. A long pause. I'll understand if you think it's too much for you. Santiago's eye is narrow. On the street, their team is known as the best. Who does this tube think he is? Then the nomad realizes he's being baited. Silverhand's already figured the score between the two partners. Santiago backs up on this. It'll be all over the street tomorrow. If he goes with it, Rogue's going to have to back his play. Rogue's right. Silverhand is a bastard. Santiago grins. You can take this punk with one hand behind his back. It's going to cost you 30 though, rocker. Done. Santiago grins and raises the stakes. And you come with us, he finishes. From her side of the booth, Rogue's eyes smolder at her partner. She'd object, but the rule of the game is... When Johnny pulled out his wallet, as far as Santiago was concerned, it became business. Done says Johnny. He is reaching out across the table to match grips with the big nomad when one long shadow falls over the table, then another. Ah, Mr. Silverhand. The bigger shadow leans closer. You can see the red LED light scrolling behind his optics, forming crosshairs as he brings the smart gun up. 
Rogue reacts her chipped reflex kicking into overdrive. Her hand is a blur as it stabs up off the table, the bunched knuckles smashing Vasolo's nose behind into his face. He's dead before he hits the floor. The spasm muscles tighten on the trigger of the big Beretta. There's a deafening boom in a very small space, but Johnny's boosted reflexes have already thrown him up and over. There's a scream as the slug rips through the back of a booth and blows through the chest of a corpse sitting on the other side of the thin wall. Rogue's other hand fires the silence auto mag from under the table, ripping the smaller solo in half. Santiago rolls, hitting the floor. Over by the bar, three figures in armor jackets stand up, weapons in hand. Santiago's Mag-10 hammers a short burst, the figures go flat. One staggers back into the window and falls through in a shattering sound like a hundred drop chandeliers. Thompson brings up the FN Fowl with studied nonchalance, covering the two remaining prone figures. Gotcha, he says. Johnny hits the bar floor, gun high and eyes scanning the corners. Patrons keep their hands away from the weapons. Everyone plays cool. The disemboweled solo on the floor whimpers. Back to back, the four of them edge out of the bar. We are seriously tagged, gasps Rogue as they hit the sidewalk. They must have tracked my trauma card, grunts Thompson. Guess they want to finish the job. You know some nice people, rocker. They reach the Porsche just in time to see the shadow of an unmarked AV4 sweep over it. Garbage, oil, and filthy water explode into steam as the jet exhaust hit the pavement. Rogue is already down, drawing a bead on the cockpit with her 44. Above her head, Santiago's Mac 10 roars in deafening staccato. A tiny red spot of her laser scope pinpoints the AV-4's pilot's forehead, even as she sees the minigun sweep around them. She's not going to make it. The canopy's got to be armored. She doesn't even have time to watch her life flash before her eyes. Then the laser dot is eclipsed by a screaming as something slams into the AV-4. The entire canopy, the entire front of the aircraft bells out in a horrible slow-mo inferno. A rancid smell of hot metal, melted plastic, and seared flesh gust against her as the AV tilts to one side and drunkenly impacts the street. A fireball shatters the night. Love those grenade launchers, smirks Thompson, lowering his steaming effing fell. We gotta get out of here, Fritz Johnny from behind a parked car. Rogue looks into his eyes. She can see the faint red etching of a targeting pattern flickering in their pale depths. Right, she says, already up and moving. Her breath catches ragged in her throat as they run back into the shadows. Santiago takes point. He knows all the best bolt holes in the area. Thompson is next, the big FN foul sweeping their way like a flashlight. Johnny keeps his HK close to his body. His nerves are tingling with booster effects. He's running like he's on speed. Alleyways streak by as blurs. He compensates his time sense. Rogue is covering the rear and he can hear her breathing behind him. He says over his shoulder to the breathing dark shadow, I'm sorry, Rach. Her voice is flat. Never call me that, she says. Never again. He keeps running. Okay, he says, finally. Fair enough. She stops running. She says, why, Johnny? Why now? Can you have gotten anyone else? She can hear him slow ahead of her. He says, I needed the best, and you're still the best, Rogue. The best. Damn him. She wakes with her mouth full of cotton wool. She's smart enough to keep her eyes closed, to stifle any urge to scream. Booster boys like it when you scream. They like it so much they'll do anything to make you scream over and over again. Alt silently trigger commands to redline her senses to maximum. She's relieved to find herself still clothed and relatively unharmed. Not typical booster, but she won't complain. Her enhanced hearing picks up breathing nearby. The click of glass is nice. Computer terminals. Definitely not boosters. Alt takes a chance and opens her eyes, spits out the gag. A slender, Asian-looking man is watching her. Neat, well-tailored suit. A glass of real scotch in one hand, which he offers towards her. Welcome, Miss Cunningham. He says, his mouth smiling and his eyes frozen. I am Toshiro. He gestures towards another man, a hulking presence lounging by the bar. This is Akira, he says. Alt sits up slowly, cautiously, her boosted senses giving her clues. The comforting weight of her plastic auto gun is missing, but she still has her cybered arm. Can I get a drink of that, she says, gesturing towards the glass in Toshido's hand. Certainly, he says, a gesture to Akira. And the Hulk turns obediently to mix a drink, all is surprised at the grace of the big man's hands. He moves like an athlete. He moves like a professional killer. Akira brings her the drink. 
and Alt doesn't even think about making a break for it. Thanks. The drink cools a pounding flame in her head. Certainly. It's the least we can do for a promising new associate. Bingo, she thinks. She's been grabbed by corporate headhunters. Fine, great. She can deal with it. Just learn the rules, play the game, and go to work. After a week, it will be just like checking into work at the ITS offices. So, she says cautiously. What kind of work do you have lined up for your new, um, employee? Toshiro leans forward, setting the drink down on the couch. He says, so, smiling. Miss Cunningham, I wish you to tell me all about the program you call Soul Killer. Her blood freezes like a silent scream. Johnny, Santiago, Thompson, and Rogue. They all perched 200 feet in the air on a rusting fire escape. From their vantage point on the black and brick side of the old Mark Luxer Hilton, they can see 10 blocks in any direction. Rogue's eyes are switched to infrared, scanning for AVs and air gyros. Johnny is watching the street below. Thompson is scanning for radio chatter, and Santiago is talking. We go in, he says. It's been two hours since the firefight. Fair enough, replies Rogue, but we do it ASAP. Santiago grins. You got a reason? Getting shot always pisses me off, she grins back. Besides, I figure they're combing the street right now, looking for us. They'll expect us to try to ditch them. They'll be putting their best out to find us. Meanwhile, the second stringers are guarding the offices. How you figure they're holding her in the Erdosaka office complex, says Johnny. The hand is in standby mode, running a test routine. Servos click and whir, and Silverhand fingers spasm and flex on their own volition. Thompson speaks up. Makes sense. The only mainframe big enough to run Soul Killer is in the main Arasaka building. Either that, or in Tokyo. We're not a big enough problem to rate flying her all the way back to Japan. Thanks. Head first in the net, Alt weaves magic. They've studded her into the Erdosaka mainframe, given her room to run, hemmed in only by three Erdosaka netrunners who watch her every move. Her body lies comatose on a contour couch, linked by cables to a cyber modem. She's pulling down subroutines, crunching the compilers, getting comfy with the CPUs. Her memory and notes, she's recreating Soul Killer, the eater of minds. Soul Killer is a stationary program, locked to a part of a system architecture. The challenge Toshiro has given her is to give it movement, the ability to navigate the net on its own. It's a subtle problem. Navigation data and decision subroutines take up a huge amount of memory. The reason free roaming programs are so limited in scope, Soul Killer already eats a lot of megabytes. To make it run free running will take more memory than any normal computer can handle. The problem excites her professionalism, even as the creation revolts her humanity. The original Soul Killer starred as a matrix to contain artificial personalities. She'd studied the concept, worked out parameters for creating a storage matrix. She'd been fascinated and awed to discover that the same matrix could contain living engrams, transfer them from computer to body, and even back again. It was immortality. ITS had taken it from her to build a killer, and she hadn't known how to stop them. Now Alt looks over her options. If she doesn't build Arasanka's monster, they'll torture or kill her. If she builds their horror, they'll keep her alive, but once it's built, they'll put her into it. A plane hinges on strange elements. Rogue leaves their motel bolt hole at 9. She moves fast, travels light moving from place to place. Here, she picks up five pounds of plastic explosives. There, flash bombs, timers, and tripwires. Santiago covers her. He picks up more explosives, a combat assault cyberdeck, and a long, bulky black sniper rifle. Johnny on the cellular, working the connections. He pulls his bandmates in from around the city, carefully dodging the phone taps, shadowers, and snoops. He sets the time and place, and the gig is on. Thompson is on the street, working hard. A phone call here, a tip to the scream sheets there. Fixer picks up a little euro on the side and passes the word down. By 10 a.m., the street knows there's going to be a party. By noon, the word is all over the street. The band is samurai. The time is sundown and the smash is free. By one, the street knows. The party is going to be on the edge of town at Industrial Park. Arasaka's 22-story office compound faces Industrial Park. Like a single hungry thing, the mob converges. p.m. A twisting construct spins, 
a blazing pillar of white fire, spark showers of stars, a glowing DNA chain, a whirling dervish takes shape and form, and the construct reality of the interface towering above her, looming like fear itself, dazzling and exudes the palpable scent of terror. It speaks in a voice like crystal and momentarily Alt's breath is taken by its perfect, murderous beauty. I am, it sings triumphantly to the cold stars. I am your controller, Alt replies. You will follow my commands. A slight hesitation in her voice. As always, it says, as though doubt had never existed in the universe. What is your bidding, mistress? Alt lets out a long, exhausted breath. She's gone with a controller, override past her watchdogs. Now she has a chance. This is what I want you to do, she begins. Seiko Harada is second in command of security for the Arasaka complex at Industrial Park. Seiko is afraid. Since early afternoon, the people have been pouring into the large grassy park opposite his guard position. At first a trickle, then a stream, then a torrent. He can't figure it out. They don't do things like this in Tokyo. In Tokyo, people are consistent. They make sense. Here, people are animals. He thinks about calling the city cops, but that would reflect badly on Arasaka. The world's largest security corporation calling for help? What a loss of face. There are 6,000 people crammed into the tableau in front of him. Up on the makeshift stage, acting as though invulnerable, struts Johnny Silverhand working the crowd up. Seiko wants him. He wants him dead. The Silverhand might as well be on Luna as far as Arasaka is concerned. A single gunshot could trigger a riot of unbelievable proportions. Seiko can feel the tension building. So can Johnny. An invisible thread binds them as adversaries. Eye to eye over a battlefield of unwitting bodies. Johnny smiles. He's got them so far. The crowd is paranoid. They expect to be thrown out at any minute. He's been pumping them for the last hour with chromatic and metal rock, getting them edgy and irritable. In a party mood to scream and shout, kick some tail. That first uniformed bozo who interrupts their party is going to get himself hosed. It's like driving the freeway at 200 miles per hour. The crowd swells and breathes at the first verse going down, taking on the cohesiveness of a living thing. The bass player picks up the back's beat, and the two of them slam in a turn of the song, dragging the crowd with them. Johnny's eyes scan the perimeter of the park. To one edge, he can see Santiago in position on the rooftop opposite of the Arasaka complex. Deep in the crowd, Thompson and Rogue are poised, ready to make the break. All he has to do is give them the chance, the diversion. All he has to do is turn around and lead 6,000 people into the wall of weapons. The moment freezes, hanging in air like a death. Punching his battered telecaster, guitar over to remote, Johnny leaps off the stage pushing his way through the crowd. His voice holds solid over the radio mic. Powerful, pleading, entreating, seducing, and the crowd turns with him, surges around him, swallows him. 6,000 people teetering on the edge, chanting singing. At the perimeter of the park, Arasaka police stand guard nervously, their eyes riveted on the mob. Silverhand starts towards them, and they choke on the decision. Twenty guards facing down a wall of humanity, centered on one man whose voice holds them, binds them. An assault rifle comes up, and the crowd, like an irritable dog, notices the small army facing them down. The scene is set. The guards distracted, and on the rooftop, Santiago takes aim. Then it goes wrong. One of the faceless guards loses his nerve. The staccato sound of the gunfire splits the air. But Johnny is already gone, faded back into a mob that howls like a wounded thing, and surges forward, shattering like surf against armored bodies, lobby doors, massed vehicles, and guns. Screams, gunfire, the strobe flash of a mob tearing a guard apart with vampire teeth and ripper claws. The sound of a sniper rifle above the melee, as Santiago methodically picks out guards and blows them away with his Walther WA-2000 rifle. The lobby doors explode inwards as 6,000 bodies slam against them. Rogue is already in, in when Santiago took out the pair of guards by the main doors. 
She's on the floor and rolling. A fast dazzle bomb palmed over the top of a security desk to fry the optics of the monitor team. Followed by a frag grenade a second later, the deafening explosion goes unnoticed in the typhoon roar of the mob. Thompson's right behind her, his video rig and FN foul sweeping everything in his path. Both wear armor jackets with the colors of the infamous Iron Sights booster gang, a known Arasaka hit group. Rogue skids around the corner towards the elevator bank, moments ahead of the crowd. Rapidly, she opens each car, spray paints the monitors, lens, punches a destination, then ducks out. The last car in line, she places a shaped charge, explosive on the ceiling, wired to a microtransmitter. This one she sends to the 22nd floor, the executive office suites, and the rampaging mob hits and carries her along in the swell. Thompson is waiting for her by the stairwell. Moments later, Johnny shows up wearing an Arasaka company jacket he's pulled off of a guard's body. The name tag reads Harada. After it turns from the security board, it has started, he announces. Instructions, Toshiro-sama? Toshiro considers. It was a master stroke for Silverhand to raise a literal army of fans against him. Toshiro is checkmated. Arasaka cannot gun down the crowd with impunity, but he does have options. He turns to Akira. Send teams to the elevators. Guard the top and bottom of stairwells and kill anything in the elevator cars. He looks over at Alt's dormant form. We have the program, he says. If we do not have her body, there is no evidence. Seemingly oblivious, the plugged in Alt permits herself a brief smile. Elevator chime opens on floors 10, 18, and 5. The fire teams on 10 and 18 throw a hail of lead through the doors. The elevators are empty. The team on 5 is warned and opens the door with greater caution. Empty! It's a trick! shouts the team leader. To the stairwell. On floor 6, a panning Johnny and Thompson reach the stairwell landing. Crack open the fire doors and scout the hall. They can hear other doors slamming open as the fire team converge. They bolt for the elevator bank. Prying the doors open, and they can see the top of the car on floor 5. They drop down to its top. Thompson hotwires the motor, and they start up. Broken can hear running feet behind her. She pauses from her vantage point on floor 7 and fires a quick burst down the stairwell. How much time, she thinks. She judges the breathing and the heavy booted tread, and punches 6 seconds on the timer, then rolls out of the 7th floor fire door. She is halfway down the hall when the first of the charges go off, collapsing the stairwell in on itself and burying the pursuing fire teams. Jamming open the elevator doors with her, with her gun butt, she drops down onto the rising car. Hold her, says Toshira. Dimly through the interface, all can feel Akira's hands pressing her onto the seat. She struggles as the tech strip her plug guards and hold her wrists. Can the program be run, Toshiro demands. His text nod. Hopeless in the grip of the interface, all can only sense Toshiro jacking himself into the cyber deck, giving him the command to run. Then her mind is ripped away. The elevator streaks upwards, the shaft echoing to either side. They can hear explosions, the sound of running feet, the hammer of machine gun fire. They pass the burned out husk of the cars on floors 10 and 18. At the 20th floor, the elevator starts to slow. Just above them, they can see the bottom of the express elevator on the 22nd. Duck and cover, yells Rogue. She taps the transmitter button on her collar and the world blows up. She floats naked in a sea of stars. Around her swirls the matrix of Soul Killer, towering into measureless space. Alt reaches out with her enhanced mentality, shaping and forming. A brief flare of thought, and Soul Killer sucks away the minds of her three guardian techs, letting their bodies drop. From the mind of the head techie, she pulls out the access codes to the mainframe's inner levels. She strips the memory of data, downloading it to her hidden files throughout the net. Twenty million dollars vanishes from accounting to reappear in a sub-account under her name. Pulling Toshiro's signature from his checking account file, she signs his name with a flourish. Using the access codes, she activates the room monitor. She can see the three techs slumped senseless in their chairs. 
Her own unconscious body, limped sprawled across the central console. Akira moves towards it. All triggers the room lasers and cuts him in two. His body hits the floor with a steaming thud. Toshiro's eyes widen in shock, then narrow as he realizes what has happened. Congratulations, Miss Cunningham, he says with mock formality. It seems you have found a way to escape your demise. You Zaibatsu bastard, she says through the interface, a tiny voice in his ear. You're gonna sit right here with your hands on the table where I can watch them. You move and your laser meet. She tracks the defense system on it, locking it to fire at the slightest position change. Then she turns back into the Soul Killer Contra, wrapping its power around her, gathering herself to transfer back into her body. The room staggers, lurches, as five pounds of, of plastique explosive slams through the ceiling of the elevator, creating an instant fireball. The lasers go wild, spilling a maze of ruby light in every direction. Toshiro throws himself flat, toppling the cyber deck and breaking Alt's connection. She flails wildly with the contract. Too little, too late. Three figures burst into the room, smart guns down a pattern of fire. IR suppressed, enhanced vision on. Johnny spots alt still form, slumped over a contour couch. He bends down for her, taking her in his arms, trembling. Across the room, Rogue looks away. Well, 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 says Thompson, striding across the wrecked room towards the corporate head. What do we have here? Looks like kidnapping and maybe murder. They're going to put you away for a long time, Toshiro-chan. His green cyber optic winks bright as he transmits live and direct to his news net. His head swivels right to the left with practice ease as he sub-vocalizes the opening to his story, the story he will use to break Erlesanka in Night City. Johnny stares a long time at Alt's almost lifeless body. There is a feeble pulse, but Alt, Alt is gone. Lost in the machine. Trapped behind crystal. Lost forever. Gone. He stands away from the couch. Cut transmission, he says to Thompson. The green cyber optic goes dark. Silverhand's own eyes are featureless white marbles. The hand convulses, and fury by his side, locking onto the HK in slow slung hip rig. He just doesn't care anymore. He's dead inside. To hell with it. Silverhand raises the big black gun. A red pinpoint centers on Toshiro's forehead. Bang, says Johnny. The hand convulses. Bang, says the gun. Silverhand turns to gather up, her still warm body in his arms. Behind the wall of monitors, a disembodied alt screams to him. But he can't hear her as he walks away. The door of the trailer swings open, and a young man in dark leathers, still dusty from the road, hauls himself into the air-conditioned command truck as light glints from the conchas on his hat and gun belt. A corned beef on rye is still half-eaten, clenched in his gunmetal gray fist. Evening, Gatos y Senoritas, Valdecado, Santiago. He sends his regrets, but he has much to do now that the war is over. Many contracts for construction, many wounded and dead to look after including family, but he has sent we Lobos to help in any way we can. Well, well, almost like old times, eh Johnny? Thompson runs the diagnostics on his epin rail one last time as he speaks. Camouflage green combat armor sits next to him, his camera already tripped into the helmet's control port. Not quite, we've got a lot better support than a thousand screaming fanboys this time. Rogue's grin quirks as she looks at Shaitan's huge camouflaged form, leaning against the massive, self-propelled artillery unit parked next to their trailer. We may be rescuing Alt, but the stakes are also a lot higher this time. A lot higher? Johnny's eyes are calm, but the hand clenches and unclenches, like it's possessed. Running loose through Arasaka's mainframes for a decade, grunts Thompson. Stands to reason, her luck was going to run out sooner or later. Last thing we need is that thing she created loose in the net after Rage's fallout. Johnny stands and looks out into the night. Finally, he says, Tonight. Tonight, Arasaka Tower falls. For the last time. Well, Johnny, I have a request. Will you stop pacing and stand still and stop asking well every minute? Shatan and I will have the door open when we have it open. This isn't like pumping the lock on a chew for you. 
Spider goes back to work on decrypting the access codes on the door alarms, while Shaitan, the full body, Borg, bypasses the physical systems. Johnny sits on his haunches, waiting. Time passes. Spider looks up from her work, distracted by Johnny's pacing. You changed your hair. I do that, replies Johnny absently. You cut your braid. Spider ignores him. Then, and we've got it. All right, the door's bypassed. Johnny stands up, the gun ready. Okay, Shaitan, you drew short straw, so you were in first. The Borg nods and lifts his gun pod. Right, see you in Valhalla if they've been lying to us. Shaitan cracks open the door, scanning it with a remote extension, then flings the door open, whipping his gun pod up in a smooth motion and firing off two quick shots from the grenade launcher. Sorry about that. Auto gun in the far corner, camera in the other, taken care of. Well, if that's all, let's get to work. Spider, the computers are in the next room. Everyone else, secure the perimeter, and let's get those demolition charges set up. Johnny strides into the room as if it were a stage and not a secret lab. Of course, it's probably the same to him. Spider thinks that she jacks her heavily shielded deck into the console before her. Hello? Alt? What? Who's there? Spider? Yep. My name's Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. What? Corny old flat vid Rach made me watch one day. Where's Rach? I thought he'd be writing point on any rescue. Rach is dead. Alt. Arasaka found his connapt and dropped the rock on it from orbit. Oh my god. Spider, I'm so sorry. Yeah, me too. And Arasaka will be too, Spider silently vows. Spider, are you almost done? Is she there? Is she okay? Chill, Johnny. Yes, I found her and I've dumped her into the memory core. Now I'm releasing a recursive virus to wipe out all mention of the Soul Killer program. And, well, it should remove any trace of evidence, at least electronic, that the Soul Killer ever existed. It's sort of like what face men use to erase an identity, only more general. Now give me some space. Make it fast. We've got to know we're here. Johnny steps back out to the outer lab, scanning for signs of trouble, which gives Spider time to walk over and download the last of the data chips. Then she closes down her deck and joins him outside, talking to that media, Thompson. What are those? Thompson asks, the cyber optic scanning the chips, Spider talks into a pocket. Information on the development team, she says. Records on external net access from the router, basic stuff. We can track down the bastards who wrote this and check for any offline storage sites. It isn't, she reflects, completely a lie. After all, she does have that information, tucked away on the first chip. It's the other ones that contain her ace in the hole. And then everything goes sideways. Going somewhere, Adam Smasher's voice cuts through the silent offices like a bullet crack. Someone screams as machine gun and shotgun fire from Arasaka troopers spray through the narrow hallway, cutting three of the team's spec ops troops in half. Spider scrambles behind a heavy pillar as Rogue and Johnny take up position behind office furniture, wholly inadequate for the job of stopping heavy fire. Spider watches Titan simply fade into near invisibility against the wall. Rogue pops off a burst from her rifle and fires two grenades. The arrows seem to want the lab intact and aren't using heavy weapons. Team Alpha is under no such constraint. Shaitan fires off blast after blast from the portable cannon he calls a shotgun, but is tagged by an auto-gun burst that sends him rolling. People on both sides spasm and fall as high-velocity death fills the entire floor of the building. Somewhere, Spider hears Thompson scream in pain. Things are bad. There are too damn many of them, plus that damned Borg. Time to make a decision. Bullets chip at her cover while she hurriedly links her cyber deck into the heavy suitcase memory stash carrying Alt. No time to double check, no time to confirm links or space available. She launches herself into the net, dragging the linked icons that represent Alt's personality, memories, and whatever else it is that makes her different from an expert system. All Alt has, she thinks, is a hope and a prayer. Here goes nothing. With a virtual toss, Spider fires the various portions of Alt out into the net, tagging them with a marker so that she can maybe retrieve them someday, and if she gets lucky enough, re-res them back into her second best, now first best, friend. On the other side of the room, Johnny crouches under a desk, fighting with his pass between bursts of gunfire. I left Alt last time, just abandoned her. Not again. Never again. Better to burn out, says the hand. Yeah, Johnny says to himself, and he knows what he has to do. Spider spends just a few seconds in the net, an eternity and never enough time. She comes back to find her cover still getting powdered, although the cacophony has diminished. 
She sees a rogue discarding her empty rifle and pulling two heavy pistols. Spider draws her own flechette pistol, its heavy weight somehow comforting in her hand. Suddenly, Johnny's voice rings out, not in song but in challenge. Hey Steelhead, let's rock and roll. Johnny is standing in plain sight. A Militech SMG in one hand, the Malorian in another, he begins pumping out rounds at Adam. Adam turns, but hesitates, astonished at the audacity of the rocker boy, challenging him with weapons that won't even crease his cyborg armor. An arm comes up, the auto shotgun and it open fires. APDS rounds cut the young rocker in half. Johnny spins and falls to the ground, a surprised look on his face, the Malorian still smoking in his fist. It only takes a second. But a second is all Shaitan needs. He seems to emerge from the wall behind Adam and grapples with him. Seeing an opening, Rogue and Spider react as one. Rogue stands, bullets streaming from her pistols like tears, breaking down Arasaka troopers. Spider sits up and fires, picking Ara targets and putting them down, one shot after another. It's all just a V sin, she says to herself. Just a game. Just a game. Adam lurches around, but Shaitan's grip is that of desperation. Spider sees that Shaitan's right arm hangs shattered and limp on his side, blasted by a grenade. It's only a matter of seconds before Adam gets free and takes them all down. Get out of here, I've got him. Shaitan's hollow, metallic voice bellows at the two women. The rest of the eras are down, but so are the spec ops. Rogue Spider and a crippled Thompson are alone with the two battling Borgs. They can hear more soldiers coming. They know they have no choice. As Spider moves to Rocker Boy's mangled form, Rogue grabs her arm. Her hard eye is boring into Spider's own. Johnny's dead, Spider. Help me get Thompson out of here. Rogue's eyes speak of certainty and incredible pain, all slammed away behind an iron will to survive. Keep the meat baggage light, Race used to say. Spider reaches inside her jacket. She pulls out the data slug Alt downloaded to her so long ago. It's surprisingly heavy. She whispers, Sorry, Johnny as she rams it home into the back of a dying rocker school. Then she turns, reaches out for the data suitcase, but sees that it, too, has been savaged by gunfire. Two friends down in as many minutes, she quietly wishes all good luck, but at least Johnny will be avenged. Spider thinks as she and Rogue drag the wounded Thompson to the elevator. She softly touches the remaining data chips in her pocket, and so will Rach. It starts with mysteries, a scrap of a song, a story your dad told you, a search for a piece of the puzzle, a tale of star-crossed lovers, a forbidden treasure, and a legacy to live up to. Unbind? Untie? Brack! Lilia wrinkles her nose as she tries to work out the next part of the verse. Sure, she can fill in the line with her own ideas, but that won't be his. It won't be what he would have said, and that's important. This might have been the last song ever. She needs to get it right. She owes him. Trace looks up from his agent, and half dozen screens, he's got linked to it. You know, that's about the 200th time you've sung that. He sighs back in his chair, and stares pensively out the sweeping glass window of the Connect. And you keep changing the tune. Fucking annoying, you know. He gives the rocker a mildly pissed off look before he relents. I know, yeah, but I don't know the tune. I don't have enough to work from. One crappy pirate data link from a crappy bunch of old recordings from a studio session that happened how many years ago? She looks up from her synth and glares at the media, who shrugs. Your problem is obvious, he observes. Yeah, you think? You need more brains on the problem. Put it out on the data pool, see if anyone bites back. Maybe there's somebody at the studio session that night. Someone who's still alive and didn't dump the memory. Trace flips the screen view from the story he's been working on. He's not making much headway anyway. Like Lilia, he's only got fragments of the whole story. And the guy who told it to him, the old man, doesn't know the whole thing either. He taps the data codes to open his personal pool link to broadcast. Holds his agent up to face Lilia. Repeat it. Again. As much as I'm fucking sick of hearing it, repeat it. And Lilia does. It's hard to say who's more surprised. When, 20 minutes later, there's a return ping and traces message link. The voice is a smooth contralto with a slight metallic undertone. Female, or voter to sound that way. I saw your post. 
I think I can help you out. In another part of Night City, Kepler is loading the upper minigun. It's been jamming too much, and she doesn't want to crank up when she's on the road away from a source of spares. She wipes her face with the back of her hand, the augmented one, and leaves a trail of cosmoline across her nose. She hears Numo chuckle from the corner of the combi, where he sits when he's running the, the data pool. He's working on his pet project, a code frag he's been tracing for almost half a decade. What? Trace is posting some song Lilia's working on. I think it's that thing she's been hammering on. His voice is rough. He doesn't use it much when he's in the face. Kepler throws a rag at him, then turns back to the minigun. I don't know why the frack those two haven't hooked up yet. She says absently. The Neverrunner flips up his goggles and begins to work through a stack of data chips. He's looking for something good that he can turn into a fast euro to fund their next trip on the road. Not everyone who works together has to hook up and get married, Cap. He replies, voice still thick with London drawl. You and me are kind of unusual around these parts. Yeah, but... Kepler pauses in mid-conversation. She spotted something. Multiple silhouettes moving through the trash piles towards the combi. Sorry. Busy, new. She grunts as she hoists herself into the saddle of a minigun. Good thing I just reloaded. She thinks that she triggers the IR in her left eye and links to the gun's processor. Her amp vision IDs the shapes as a group of boosters trying to flank the combi's position. Looks like the iron sight boys are back. She flips the safety off, swivels the gun, and cuts loose. The roar of a heavy minigun shakes the whole combi, knocking books off shelves and dishes across the kitchenette. Iron sights ganger scatter, fall. Some drag their wounded out of her field of fire. She cuts the minigun. No sense in wasting ammo. Those guys aren't going to be coming back for a while. Hey, Cap, says Numo, unplugging his ears with his extended cyber digits. Trace just pinged me. Something interesting. Kepler grins. She was starting to get bored. Damien's just finished replacing the pistons in the forearm when the ping comes. Cracking Russian cyberware, he thinks, turning and letting his drone crawl down his arm toward the agent propped up on the workbench. The drone's mag clamp picks up the agent and brings it back to him. He talks out of the side of his mouth as he struggles with the recalcitrant Russian arm. Go ahead, he says. He doesn't actually need to talk to the agent. He's wired for full radio slash audio. But customers appreciate the personal touch of seeing your face. He listens to Trace for a few minutes, then puts down the cyber arm and shuffles out to the workshop door. Yo, Zara. The solo looks up from the target she's been punching holes in. Not too many people practice archery these days, but she's always thought it was a useful skill. Silent, well-ranged, and you almost always get your ammo back. What? She replies, slotting her optics back from targeting mode. We're in trouble or something? Damien stands in the door of the ramshackle metal container slash office. Nah, he says with a grin. Just Trace and Lilia. They want us to cover their high-priced butts while they check out one of Trace's story leads. Zara pushes in the retainer, and the bow folds down into an easy-to-carry package. The arrows are also collapsible, and she keeps them in a holster across her back. The bow isn't her only weapon. As a professional, she's also a crack shot with the Kang Tao she keeps in her shoulder holster. She shrugs. Trace is a reliable source of income. He's a lot smarter than most of the clowns she gets as her principals. She's good with anything he comes up with. Let's roll. She says, picking up her go bag and heading to her bike. So, like I said, I think I can help you, she says. She is named Samantha, and she's seven feet tall. Chrome from head to toe, she looks like a metal Amazon, down to the shaped metal muscles. Incongruously, she's wearing a tank top and warm leggings on a body that never feels pain or temperature, unless she wants to. Full body conversion thinks Damien. He's staring at her like a dog, looking over a steak. Not of lust, but with the desire to get in there and dismantle her to see how she ticks. Her cool blue cyber optics look him over, then through him, focusing on Lilia. You're the rocker boy? Samantha asks in that smooth contralto. 
Lilia nods, and Samantha gestures to a couple of overstuffed leather sofas around a central coffee table. Grab a seat, she offers. They do. Trace's trained eyes scan the room. It's like a garage. No, it is a garage, except with a few pieces of overly comfy furniture set up in strategic spots. There's even a huge feather bed off to one side, but three things stand out in particular. One is a full-size sports car parked in one of the vehicle's bays, immaculately preserved for a vehicle two decades old. The second is a large framed hollow of a rocker boy, the legendary Johnny Silverhand in an alcove surrounded by digital candles and assorted concert memorabilia. The last thing is a large wooden crate. It's about eight feet long, four feet wide. It's bound with metal straps and has several sophisticated lock and defense devices bolted to it. Samantha sits down gracefully. Everything she does appears to be graceful. As they join her, she reaches in into her silvery cleavage. There's a soft pop and a small panel opens between her breasts. She extracts a slim plastic wafer, a data chip. She holds it up in front of Lilia. What you have is just a fragment, Samantha explains. Someone was there that night after the club was closed. They grabbed a sample before the bouncers threw them out. But what I have, and here, she gestures with the slim blue chip, is the complete song, recorded in his voice, Johnny Silverhands. There's something in her voice, something that penetrates even through the perfectly bodered tones. A sense of awe. Both Trace and Kepler's eyes meet as they catch it. She's a Silverhand fangirl. They think at the same instant. She's been saving this chip like a memento all these years. Samantha continues. But before I give you this, I should tell you a couple of things. The chip was recorded by Johnny just before his disappearance in 2023, but it's been damaged by, well, it's been damaged by an EMP blast. Damien scans the chip with his eyes, cranked to maximum magnification. After a few seconds, he says, Radiation, right? Samantha looks surprised. How did you know? The tech shrugs. After the nuke, there are tons of blasted chips and other electronics around town. I'm a tech, right? I get people all the time bringing EMP damaged chips to me. I've got to know the signs. Samantha sits back thoughtfully. Well, Okay then, the whole song is there, I think. But part of it is garbled, like an encryption. I'm no tech, I couldn't recover that part. I just made a copy of the original. This is one of those copies. Her eyes close as though she's remembering something painful. You can have it though, she finally says. Grace watches Samantha's face as she hands Lily up a chip. Finally, he says, so what do you want in exchange? Samantha looks surprised. Then resign as the media says, This is Night City, Chumba. In this city, nobody gives anyone anything without a price. So name it. The silver woman slowly nods. Okay, just one thing. But it's kind of a big thing. She gestures to the large wooden crate nearby and says, I need you to deliver that to another place. A city in New Mexico to a place called Los Alamos Labs. They're dragging the crate towards a combi. Samantha is with them, but toward the back. The gang drops and all around them. They drop the crate and a firefight ensues. In the staccato din of auto-fire weapons and the boom of heavier guns, Kepler runs toward the combi, with Zara and Numo covering her back. Numo tosses a dazzler bomb at their pursuers. Reaching the driver's side, Kepler opens a cargo hatch in the combi's back. Meanwhile, Samantha has manhandled the crate up onto her shoulders. She staggers toward the combi just as the cargo hatch drops, slamming into the street. She tells Zara to dump her bike out the back. She'll take care of it. Numo pushes the bike out onto the street, and Samantha almost throws a crate into the cargo bay before staggering back. It's in. Now get out of here, she yells at the full deafening volume of her voter. Damien yells to Samantha, You fireproof? Be a pretty stupid firefighter if I wasn't, she retorts, her overstressed ventilation system wheezing. Groovy. He yells, then opens up with a long tank slash hose until he's pulled out of the back of the combi. A huge gout of fire streams out into the middle of the gangers. Napalm. Kepler guns the combi, blasts right through the fire and over the debris toward the road, pausing only to let Trace and Lilia clamber aboard through the open doors. They hurtle through the wreckage of a glowing hot zone, pursued by several road warrior vehicles. 
packed with gangers. By now, everyone is shooting back at their pursuers. As they pass access points, Nemo takes control of various cranes and other building machines, including a pair of huge Graf 3 construction mecha, which he uses to knock over one of the scaffolds surrounding a half-constructed building. The scaffold crushes one of the pursuing punk knots, but the rest keep chasing. Suddenly, Kepler slams a hard right and tears down between a row of snagged cargo containers. Ganger is still glued to her trail, she slams through a security fence and into a large area framed by hundreds of containers. From all angles, leather-clad nomads rush out with weapons. They recognize the combi as one of theirs and turn their fire on the gangers, who run. Kepler slams on the brakes, kills a motor. She slumps back in the sea as a large nomad with an immense handlebar mustache and a rakish Stetson cruises up to the driver's window. He's carrying a smoking M249 saw. He smiles and says in a friendly drawl, Little lady, you're planning to join up with the rest of his convoy. You're cutting it a mite fine, I'd say. Good thing the convoy was big enough, commented Numo, with four of them now crammed into the passenger compartment. The convoy is 29 feet long, shaped like a heavily armored smooth-sided box. It can sleep eight, ten in a pinch. It's a standard design used by nomad families all over the southwest. Bathroom, kitchen, and storage space is all crammed throughout its capacious road frame. The Kumbai is her home, the last thing Kepler ever got from her family in Florida. It's blinding midday, heat shimmers rising off the line of endless asphalt headed east. Around them are dozens of vehicles, low-slung cyberbikes, armed and armored ground cars of all makes and models. Assorted combines similar to their own, and towards the middle of the gigantic looming shapes of the road haulers, the big multi-jointed nomad ground truck trains that can carry tons of cargo, containers as well as space for at least half a dozen families each. We're lucky they let us in, comments Numa with a grin. Kepler shakes her head. Not nah, lucky, babe. It's things to trace. The Alticados are like, well, fucking nomad royalty. She props her feet up against him. Numo is driving and she's taking the opportunity to rest her shoulders after her midnight hell drive. She adds, you don't just turn down the son of old man Alticado if you still want a place in the families. A clink interrupts her explanation. Damien is tinkering with some upgrade to the combine's engine he plans to install when they camp down for the evening. Over the rush of highway noise, she can also hear Lilia's synth pinging as a rocker tries to pin down the song she keeps working on. Running down the main storage bay of the combine, taking up the space that would normally hold Zara's bike, is the crate. It's surprisingly heavy. It's also, surprisingly, well protected. Samantha has warned them in no uncertain terms not to open the crate. Open it, and you'll be signing your own death warrants, she says. Even I can't open that thing. Just haul it out to New Mexico, so the address I've downloaded to your agents, and it's done. She's also given them several thousand EB for expenses, but that's not the point. In Night City, if you promise someone you'll do something, you just do it. In the back of a combi, Zara sits, staring at her hands pensively. She finally reaches into her go bag and pulls out a large wrapped package. It stinks of cosmoline, and as she unwraps it, she can see that the big gun has seen a lot of use, but has been well taken care of, all the same. As she was heading out of the garage, Samantha took her aside. You should take this, the silver woman said. He's not ever going to use it again, and I think you're the right person to carry it for. Like Samantha, the huge automatic is silver chromed. Zara lifts it, sights down the barrel. It seems very heavy, heavy with some ineffable quality. It's more than its weight. She thinks she knows what it is, but she's afraid to find out. While the rest of the group are gathered for food, Trace wanders over to the middle of the nomad camp. He asks a few questions, then some more, until eventually, guided by the information he's gathered, he draws up to the fire next to a thin, Long-haired man, roughly around 40. The nomad raises a metal flask, companionably, at him. You drink, young Aldecado? You know me? Responds Trace. Raising the flask and taking a swig, the nomad nods. I haven't seen you in a spell. Let's see. You were about 17 last time. 
I had a lot less gray in my hair then. You knew my old man, right? Yes, I did. Mind if I ask you about something? The nomad chuckles. Fire away, young Aldecado. So, the old man told me a bit about the Arasaka thing. About the bomb. The fight. Trace looks at the nomad speculatively. He said you were there. His companion nods. Takes back the flask and draws a swig. Long time ago, that Trace just looks at him, then to the fire, then back to the nomad again. When you're young, Chumba, you think you're immortal. The old nomad reaches out, stirs the dying fire, then he looks back at Trace. So old man Santiago never told you what went down that day? He told me some of it, but even he didn't know the end. Well, that's because he wasn't there. He'd move on a bit from his days chasing around with Rogue and Johnny. Met your ma, settled down, ended up taking over the leadership of the family. But me, I was there to the bitter end. I was a lot younger then, of course. About your age, in fact. I was one of El Lobos, the wolves, the warriors of the Aldecados. Wore a lot of leather and carried a long rifle. Made a bit of a name for myself, in fact. So, let's see. We dropped out of the AV on the top floor. Shaitan covered the entry, and Spider Murphy was hacking the, the cyberspace defenses. Johnny, I don't know why he was there. Maybe he was feeling bad about not having rescued his companera after all those years. Anyway, he was there, with his big silver arm and his big silver gun. And we went in, to where the Eras had their lab, where they were keeping Silverhand's lady friend. Ten floors down in the building. Then, they jumped us. They got the reporter guy in the first attack. We Lobos were pinned down. I lost my brother, Antonio, that day. And that the Smasher, he came rolling in like La Tormenta, would have killed all of us. But then Silverhand stands up and yells something at him and starts shooting. He had to know it wasn't going to do any good. Even that big silver gun wasn't going to stop the Smasher. But he tried and got torn up for his trouble. But it gave Shaitan a chance to get a grip on the Smasher and hold him while we grabbed the reporter and piled for the elevator to the top. We had to leave the rocker behind. We just ran out of time. Here's what I still don't get. Here's what I still don't get. We were carrying a suitcase. They didn't tell me what it was, but it was pretty heavy. And during the fight, I looked around for that Morgan guy, the head cabron but he was nowhere in sight. He just took off with the suitcase, and I think he headed down the stairwell. I didn't see him until we were lifting off in the extraction AV, when he and that bastard smasher went at each other. About a minute or two later, as we were pretty far from the building, that nuke went off. Trace's eyes narrow. This is what he's been looking for. Early in the morning, Don, on the road, Kepler stays to the middle of the convoy, toward the back. After several hours, dry desert scrub hurtling by endlessly, they spot something, a dust cloud rising in the back, way back in the heat haze. Trace pulls out his drone and deploys it. It streaks back, relaying its imagery back to the waiting media. After a few minutes, he grunts, we got trouble coming, bike gang, but not the normal road warrior type bikers. These guys are anything but the typical Go Gang. It's nearly 50 Osozoku bikers. The dreaded Japanese bikers, heavily armed. These guys are elite. They have really good bikes armed with serious weapons. Machine guns, grenade launchers, rockets. They're also really good looking. Japanese idol singer good looking. Lilia's aghast. We're gonna get killed by a fucking boy band? She yells over to Zara. Up to now, Zara hasn't jacked into the gun. But this is a bad situation, no time to get warmed up on a new weapon. She pulls a link cable out of the butt of a big silver automatic, jacks it into her wrist. After a moment, her eyes blur. The target ridicule with all of its accessories, heads up display, overlay her vision. I'd rather die, yells with Solo back as she aims, fires, aims again in a ceaseless rhythm. Damien cuts in. Was that guy wearing makeup? Zara shakes her head. Not well, Lilia snorts, if you want to call it that. The Bosozoku unfurled tall, 
black flags from their rear fenders and move in at high speed. Kepler guns it, putting the combi further into the middle of the convoy. Then the horde of bikers are all on them. Engines howling. The pack of bikers flank the convoy. The convoy opens up, weapons from combis and road haulers hammering, spewing shell casings all over the road behind them. Nomad gyrocopters sweep down from the sky, sweeping the horde with light auto fire. The bikes are hard to hit. They weave in and out of the convoy, looking for something, probing, until they eventually spot the team's combi. While the Kepler weaves in and out of the tightly packed mob of vehicles, trying to shake their pursuers, Numo mans the top turret, sweeping heavy 50 cal machine gun fire down range while struggling to avoid hitting any other members of the convoy. Meanwhile, Zara and Lilia lean out of the armored combi windows and start tagging targets as we move in a range. A biker tries to cut in front of Kepler, aiming to block her. Kepler revs the combi and rolls over him. Another biker runs up the open ramp of a nearby road hauler and goes airborne, leaping over the combi and trying to drop a grenade on Numo. Without thinking, Zara snap shoots a grenade out of the air. The gun's interface seems to boost her situational awareness to absurd levels. It almost seems to take over her, giving her a seamless supernatural accuracy and a palpably cold eagerness. Later, Damien will determine that the gun's cyber interface has been modified to create almost cyber psycho levels of feedback, damping, damping down the user's normal emotional reaction to combat situations and giving them a robot-like control. But there's no time for that now. She keeps firing. Two bikers swing out of the driver's side, opening fire on Kepler's rear quarter. Damien drops up from one of the gun ports and dumps a combination of napalm and fire into the road. The combine on the other side swerves and, sp and sprays the leading biker with auto fire. The bike skids and almost crashes into Kepler, who yanks the wheel to the right to avoid the bullet spray. She slams into the biker flanking them on the passenger side, who spins out into his partner. The outspace for the explosion as the road hauler runs down both fallen bikes. The big road haulers start dropping spike mats. Then there's a sound of jet engines getting louder and louder with an ear shattering sound of thunder. Three Nomads AV-4s drop in over the dry foothills, the red eye directed miniguns hammering a high-pitched song of death. The big side doors roll back, revealing mounted 50 cals that sweep doom from all sides. Kobosa Zoku try to rally, but the sheer volume of fire breaks their ranks. Protected by their hovering AV escorts, the convoy powers on toward the relative safety of distant Albuquerque. The convoy has pulled over in the tiny deserted ghost town of Grants, New Mexico. There used to be a Walmart in Grants. The stores have since been busted out and the entire building has been well looted, but the immense parking lot is still there, covered in drifting sand in some places, and the convoy is using it to take some time to lick its wounds and reload its weapons. Overhead, the AVs orbit, watching the road in either direction. But down in the convoy, there's a new fight in progress. Okay, what the hell's going on? Shouts Lilia, sounding well. Pissed isn't half of it. Zara rubs her head angrily. Yeah. What's so important as someone's willing to send a whole fracking army of mercenary bikers after us? Guys like that aren't cheap. That's corporate level shit. Numo shrugs. Are you sure we were the target? Trace shakes his head. I had the drone out watching. The biker swept the whole convoy, then zeroed in on us. There's no doubt we were who they were looking for. Look, no one was trying to kill us before we took this job. Well, the one who wasn't usually trying to kill us. Lilia gestures at the crate. And they didn't attack us on the way in, only on the way out. After we picked up the crate, says Kepler. Yeah, says Zara. The crate. Everyone stares at everyone else. No one wants to ask the next question. Finally, Trace looks over at Damien. So, you've been snooping around like I suspect you've been? Damien looks a bit abashed. He spreads his hands. Only external scans, he confesses. And, Trace prods. Um, yeah, says Damien. Okay, it's using a lot of stored power. Pretty radioactive at one end. Will kill us. But I'd say make sure your RAND filters were working all the same. You want me to try and hack the protective systems, offers Numo. Kepler shakes her head in the negative. 
I keep thinking about what the nice silver senorita said, says Trace. The part about signing our own death warrants particularly stands out in my mind. Zara grimaces. Yeah, but someone's already trying to kill us twice to get this. That's why I call a pretty big hint. Numo laughs. Kepler folds her arms and glares at Numo. I'm against this. There's a world of hurt in that crate, and I want nothing to do with opening it. We agree to deliver it. That's all we should do. On the other hand, if we're going to die, retorts Lilia, I'd really like to know what we're going to be dying for. Hell, I already know what's in there, Trace asserts. The rest of the group stares at him, expectantly. He shakes his head. It's Johnny Silverhand. They stare at him as though he's just announced he's a space lizard from Planet X, and he raises a hand before the arguments start. Look, it makes sense. I ran a search on our patron. She used to be a pararescue before the war. Firefighter. First into the wreckage when the nuke went off. Already had a history with Silverhand when she saved him from a studio fire back in 2015. And she's a Silverhand fangirl. Maybe a Silverhand groupie even. I hear he got around a lot and wasn't particularly picky. So, Silverhand vanished right after the nuke. No one's seen him since. Word on the street was Johnny was working on a big job with some of his old mates. A hit on Arasaka. You put the clues together, and it's obvious. Silver fangirly found Johnny's body and put it on ice. And now we're moving it. I got past the ice, announces Dumo suddenly. He's not one to wait around for the committee to decide. He looks over at Damien. Your turn, he says. The tech hunkers down, working with his tools in the, until there's a distinct click. Meanwhile, Kepler watches them both, furious. Damien and Numo stand back, removing the blocky protective locks as they do so. Then they punch the access switch. There's a dull chuff as the seals on the crate release. Damien slides back the top as Zara stands ready to open fire with the big silver automatic. The rest of the group peers over the lip of the crate, packed tightly into the protective foam padding. It's an 8 foot long, 4 foot wide, high vest, gray cylinder, shaped like a torpedo. It's covered in numbers, letters, and many, many words in Japanese. Angry words. Largest in the center is a huge yellow and black radioactive warning. Everyone stands silent for a long, long time. Finally, Trace clears his throat. Well, I guess I'm fucked, he says. They all stare at the crate and its deadly contents for a long while. Then, I'm gonna have to tell the trail master, says Kepler. They'll need to know. She sounds flat, almost defeated. But why? asks Lilia, looking up from an ominous orange shape in the crate, confusion all over her face. Because of a law of the broken wheel, replies Kepler. There are blank faces all around, save traces. He nods his head slowly. The law of the broken wheel, he repeats. Back even before the bad old days, the people who built the nukes wanted to make sure that even a thousand years later, their descendants would know not to mess with the stashes and stockpiles of atomic weapons, old reactors, nuclear waste. So, they spread the idea of the broken wheel, a simple iconography that even a post-Holocaust culture could remember, the atomic trefoil. It's a broken wheel. Every nomad kid learns about it. It's one of our most important bits of culture. Nomads run into old atomics all the time. The law of the broken wheel is that when you find something with that symbol, you get out of there fast, and you leave it alone. It is forbidden to travel on the broken wheel, intones Kepler solemnly, like a small child reciting a catechism. Convoys, scavengers, even pirate families avoid it like the plague. You're not allowed to keep anything marked by the wheel and no family will carry it. It's an absolute taboo. She stands up, spreads her hands, face determined. You want to come with me, Trace? Justin, he also stands. I hope you lug it in. Guess I'll take the hit with you. Only fair, Chumba. They both rise and climb out of the combi, moving to the head of the mass of parked vehicles. Looks like Trace's connections were enough to keep us in the convoy after all, mutters Numo. Shut up, grates Kepler. I'm still royally pissed at you. She adds as she powers the combine down a dusty highway. The trailmaster kicked them out at Albuquerque. The rest of the convoy still headed east on US-40 to Oklahoma City. The group is now traveling north of Santa Fe on a dusty, potholed road, framed by dismal and lonely signs for Highway 84 North. The ghost road, 
Probably no one's come up here since the start of the war. Shifting sands cover parts of it, punctuated by cracked, overheated asphalt. They've covered a fair distance by the time they hear the sound of jet engines. Over the hill sweeps what Night City inhabitants call a panzer. A light fan tank with armor and a large 30mm cannon. It's way out of their league. And now, it's blocking the highway. Well, grunts Trace. Guess it's time to saddle up or die. Hey, so yeah, they have a tank. Big deal, says Damien. We've got a nuke. Not funny, snaps Lilia, slamming a clip into her Minami 10. They won't shoot at us, asserts Numo. The whole point is to get the bomb, or secondary. Kepler looks back at it momentarily. Maybe we should just surrender, Nu. But Trace shakes his head. We're witnesses. They aren't going to want to leave anyone alive. Now if these guys are who I think they are. So, we're screwed, blued, and tattooed, says Zara. She lifts a gun, pulls out the interface cable, and plugs in. Might as well get ready for that last stand then. They're starting to take up positions when the panzer explodes. Two attack AV-9 spiral out of the sun, miniguns driving a hailstorm of death before them. The remnants of a panzer, victims of Elite AV-9's anti-tank missiles, is still a blazing inferno. Its ammo cooking off on the second AV-9 settles down to earth in a swirl of jet engines and kicked up dust right across their path. The cockpit of AV slides back flanked by an imposing pair of heavily armored guards, a small female figure climbs to the ground. She's dressed in black armor, but instead of a helmet, she sports a cheerful pink beret. She waves to the dumbfounded group in the combi. Hi there, she calls in a clear, girlish voice. I'm Michiko, I'm here to rescue you. I owe you an explanation, Michiko begins as she sits down at the open crate, treating its contents as though a multi kiloton atomic weapon was every day to her. I've been following you for some time, but I first had to deal with a problem back in Night City that delayed me. There's a pregnant pause, which seems to imply that someone, somewhere, or maybe even a large number of someones, are no longer among the ranks of the living. You're Michiko Arasaka, right? Avere's trace is brown's furrow, and Michiko smiles. I really haven't gone by that name since I married, but yes, I am Michiko Arasaka. She looks down at the orange cylinder she's sitting on and adds, I suppose technically, this bomb is mine too. She laughs a twinkly little laugh that from anyone else would have seemed like something out of an anime, but from her seems singularly appropriate. You see, she continues in a quiet purposeful voice, as soon as an atomic weapon was detonated in the towers, my father sent people in to examine the ruins, and when they found that a weapon was actually a Miltech device, they were both relieved and concerned. Relieved because this meant Arasaka wasn't the cause of so much death and destruction, but concerned because what only a few people in the company knew was that Arasaka had also planted its own weapon in the towers, a much more powerful one, in the event that Militech was able to overrun the headquarters and take possession of the secrets inside. My father's men were especially concerned because when they searched for our bomb, the Arasaka weapon, it was missing. They determined that only a very strong person, or full body conversion, could have moved it. So they used radiation scanners to track the trail, and eventually found the device had been hidden in the basement of a nearby garage, owned by a firefighter paramedic named Samantha Stevens. Unfortunately, my father passed away. He died before he could give the location team further instructions. So the decision was made to just leave the bomb where it was but to keep a watch on the garage and firefighter unless it was moved, and stayed in the garage for 15 years. Until now. So, you had your own bomb? Presses Trace. But before Michiko can respond, Numa leans over, waving his agent in front of her. And these are the trigger codes, aren't they? He says, his cool British tones laden with amusement. Michiko's eyes scan the agent's screen and widen. These could very well be them, she confesses. Is one of my father's command codes. She looks up, and large brown eyes narrow. How did you get these? She asked, the girlish voice shifting to a sharp staccato of practice command. Numa's grin is triumphant. I've been trying to track down what these were for the past five years. Pull them out of a system that was later traced to a drifting yacht. As it happens, a yacht owned by your late father. He and Michiko exchange smiles, like friendly sharks. 
interrupted only when Kepler cuts in with a dry, and he's been a regular pain about it too. She smacks Numo on the head with one hand, but not too hard. And that's why you've been tailing us? Says Zara flatly. Arasaka wants to make sure their nuke never makes the headlines. No, they want to make sure whoever does have it doesn't set it off, counters Numo. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has the detonation codes by now. I know there were others looking, much as I try to cover my tracks. In my case, I really didn't know what the codes went to. I just wanted the answers. But you can bet the other hunters do know, especially if they also work for Arasaka. And someone wanted this thing to be taken off the market before the other guys could find it. Damien cuts in, and his expression turns grim. Los Alamos was a famous nuclear facility, back before the collapse even. Stands to reason, if there's any place you could get a nuke dismantled safely, it would be there. I have renounced the name of Arasaka, says Michiko, her small voice still hard and flat. I have not renounced the responsibility of that name. Far from it. And there are factions in the company that would use this weapon for their own ends. Some would use it to discredit what little good will Arasaka has built up after the war. Some would use it as a threat to make Arasaka more powerful, be able to blackmail cities, even governments. It's because I had to deal with these people first that I was delayed from coming to your aid sooner. And for that, I am truly sorry. Michiko stands up, her girlish demeanor instantly gone as though a switch has been flipped. I am the heir of Kai Arasaka, she continues, no matter what I feel about my legacy, so I will act and help you take this demon's tool to a place where it can be properly disposed of. She looks up at the group around her. Will you agree? Damien chuckles. We can be on the side with the big ass gunships, or we can go up against the big ass gunships. Sounds like an easy choice to me. He raises an eyebrow, cyber optic blending in a harsh light. Anyone think differently? There are various nods of assent. The die is cast. The rest of the trip is uneventful, as the black AVs hover overhead protectively. About midday, they peel off to the north. Michiko radios a cheery, good luck, and then they reach the front gates. Los Alamos Labs is huge, covering an infinity of acreage. Most of it's falling apart. No one's been here in a decade as far as Kepler can tell, as she threads through the maze of rusting security gates and warning signs. Over her shoulder, Grace is reading Samantha's directions from his agent, while Nuo tries to pick up any kind of net system still act in the endless ghost town. There, gestures Trace at last, pointing to the left. Kepler makes a turn and comes to a stop in an outside lot filled with assorted ground cars. This is building PF4, says Damien in disbelief. This is the heart of America's nuclear deterrent, he snorts. The Plutonium Lab is a nondescript two-story brown building in a clutter of nondescript buildings. If it wasn't so huge, we wouldn't even notice. Is it safe to get out? asks Lilia. Damien shrugs. We've all got enough anti-rad drugs in our system to pretty much stop anything short of a gamma burst. But the counter reads low background. That thing in the crate is probably emitting more heat than what's outside. Sara climbs out of a combi, a big silver gun drawn. Then she freezes. A half dozen security cams are watching them. There's a tiny hum as two roof-mounted auto guns track in line with the cams. Then, a woman's voice comes out of the hidden speakers. I'll bet Sammy gave you that. Zara nods slowly, holding it up. The voice continues. Hang on tight. I'll be right down. A long, long minute passes before one of the heavy shielded roll-up doors finally opens, and a blonde woman in battered work clothes emerge. She waves and walks over to them. Hey, you're the guy Sammy sent? Welcome to the lab. I'm Angel. She offers Zara a slim, well calloused hand. Glad to see you made it. The blonde woman is tall and almost ethereally beautiful, in a way that seems to reflect a life of hardship and pain. A large text tool belt hangs loosely around her waist. As the rest of a group climbs out of a combi, weapons at the ready, she grins and walks over. Rough trip? Numa shrugs. Been better. You are drop off? Angel nods. Mind if I check it out before delivery? Kepler punches the ramp button and the back of a combine winds open to reveal the loading bay. Angel walks up to the crate and looks into it. Looks like a bomb to me, she says finally, and slaps her hands together in a business-like way. Well, let's roll it inside, 
she adds briskly, so I can get this thing disarmed. Trace raises an eyebrow. You're going to disarm it? Angel nods. Can't think of a better place to disarm a lost atomic warhead than a place that makes them. She whistles one short tone, and from the depths of a building, a large power transport car emerges. Damien nods to himself. Of course, they'd use robotics here, he thinks. The place is probably too dangerous for most non-shielded people. The car rolls to a stop between them, and a Kepler maneuvers the combine's lift gates to slide the crate onto it. It sags under the weight. Angel gives a satisfied nod. I have to thank Sammy for finding you. This thing has been on her mind since the day she found it. You have taken a real load off her shoulders. She turns back, raises a hand ex exposing a thin blue plastic silver, a cash chip. You did a great job, and I want to thank you. Angel hands the chip over to Kepler, whose eyes widen as she reads the amount on his display. Sonova, you earned it, says Angel. Who buy yourselves another combi or something? She whistles at the cart and starts trundling back to the roll-up door with the crate aboard. Then she stops. That's right. She says suddenly. Sam told me you met because your rocker was looking for something. Samantha gave me this data chip, says Lilia. Angel nods. She pulls out a second chip. This one is a match for the one in Lilia's hand and flips it to the start of the rocker. Here, she says. This is a full recording of a song you wanted, made from the original studio session. Lilia protesting, says... But how did you? And as Angel reaches the door, she looks back and chuckles, and says with a lilt in her voice, Sammy is the only Johnny Silverhand fangirl out there, you know. And then she and the crate are gone in the bowels of a huge brown building of PF4. There's a pause. Finally, Trace says, So, now that we're filthy rich, want to see if we can buy a drink somewhere? Crack that, replies Zara. Remember that place we passed outside of San Pueblo? She drops a big silver gun into the holster at her back and smiles. I think we should go back there and buy the whole fracking bar. I'm dying, says Samantha over the comm link. All the dose I took when I moved the bomb has finally hit my spinal cord. Answer. You shouldn't have done it, Sammy, says Angel. Or waited till I could have sent help. But Samantha shakes her head. We didn't know who or what owned the thing. The rad detectors were going off all over the place from the last one. I hadn't been full body, I hadn't been a rad shielded firefighter, I would have been dead within the hour. As it was, I had enough time to clear all the important stuff out of that wrecked bunker and get rid of the hot stuff at the bottom of the bay. And I thank you for doing that, Angel replies. Then, adds sadly, are you sure I can't do anything to help? Samantha shakes her head. I promise I will give him to you in the end. It took me a while to find the right people, people I could trust, but they did the job. Now my bit is over. She sighs, breathes heavily, as if blowing hair. Hair that hasn't been there in three decades. Out of the way. Gonna go get me a glass of good rye whiskey. Sit back on the couch. I feel it's about time. I'll hit the kill switch and shut down my life support. Carefully. Angel rolls the heavy bomb casing over. She punches a code into the small keypad, now exposed. There's a hissing of compressed air, of utter cold that blows back her hair, as the casing splits to reveal the blue-white ice of the hidden Cairo chamber. She looks tenderly down at the dark, frozen face behind its masking curtain of ice. Hello, my love, she says.